Welcome to today's edition of Daytime Dialogues. It's my great pleasure to welcome one of the great scholars of Tanakh in our world, but even more importantly, the great teachers of Tanakh, Rabbi Menachem Liebtag. Rabbi Liebtag is the founder of the Tanakh Study Center at www.tanakh.org, spelled in the old-fashioned way, T-A-N-A-C-H, no Ks right there. But he's also a faculty member at Yeshivat Haritzion, at Matan, at Midrash, at Lindenbaum, at Shalavim for Women, and also at MTVA, Midrash of Taravi Avodah. But more importantly, he's one of those people who has really helped to transform Torah learning because of the way he's taken an understanding of text of Tanakh and brought things together. He was one of the pioneers in this area, and it's a great pleasure to be able to welcome him. Thank you, Rabbi Liebtag, for joining me today. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let me just start out with the simple things. Born in Akron, went to uh, Gush as a Talmud, stayed based- Went to public school first. Public school, okay, public school okay. first. Ultimately went to Gush, went to Machon Lev, came back to Gush. How did you end up focusing on Tanakh as your passion? By accident. Really? So yeah. it's uh, it's a pretty good accident, you know. Yeah. So where was the accident? And how did, I, you, I how went, did you duck? I, I came to Israel to BMT back in 72. Yeah. And then okay, I met... For those who don't know, I went to BMT also, but BMT yeah. was the first American yeshiva. It was founded uh, with Rabbi Horwitz, who was the Rosh yeah. Yeshiva, uh, also a Chicago one originally, actually from Wisconsin first, but via Chicago. And uh, you came in 72 to BMT. Yeah, and then mm -hmm. um, I was there for a couple of months. I used to play baseball on Friday in Gan Soccer. And I met a bunch of friends who were studying in Mahon Lev, whose parents made Aliyah. And I was supposed to go to Columbia University in engineering. And I liked my, uh, I, I met, there's some really nice people there. So I decided to switch to Mahon Lev in engineering there and not go to Columbia. I saved a lot of money and had a lot of good friends and played baseball for four years. Okay, and, you, uh, and your degree yeah. was in electro-optics? And yeah, we did electro optics, yeah. So I'm still and trying to figure out how you got to Tanakh, though. So then I was supposed to do the army, but uh, and I was there for the Yom Kippur War, and I decided to I have to do the army. And but I still wanted to learn more time in Yeshiva because I left, you know, BMT a year early. So I decided to do Hesder. So I did Hesder in Gush, and in my army service in Hesder, I was able to work out to work in my field because the people I went to school with were all in Keva in electro optics, and they used to do their homework for them in English. <laughs> so, um, they need, so I helped them, and so I, I worked in the army for like a year and a half, two years in Hesder, working on other, on that stuff. And I almost signed; I was going to sign Keva. You know, Keva. So I was going to be full time army with my right. friends. And before I signed, I went to America for a visit to LA to visit my friends there, and that's when I found my wife, and or she found me, and uh, I got married, and I decided to stay another year in Yeshiva because I just got married, and then I stayed in, then. At the last minute, you know Rabbi Adler, Arla? Of course. Yeah. So he was in charge of Americans. And last minute that year, he got a job in Beersheba to start the Yeshiva High School in Beersheba. And then uh, what happened? Um, they needed someone to take care of the Americans. And I was the older guy. So I said, okay, I'll stay for a year and take care of the Americans for a year. And I had a lot of fun. I was 81, 82. That year, like there's like 20 rabbis from that year. Natty Helfgott, uh, Yosef Konevsky, Chaim Martyr. Was there? Ari Greenspan is not rabbi, but the, uh, there's, that was a really good Joel Finkelstein. Oh, wow. Joel okay. With a Sussman. That was a really good year. Good kids. And then, but we still haven't gotten to Tanakh yet. Wow. So um, <laughs> I, I, I I was at, in Yeshiva, I was a Talmud of Rabbi Obanun and okay. Rabbi Boyer, and, and, but especially Rabbi Obanun. And I loved his stuff. Um, and I wanted what he was teaching, I wanted to give to the Americans. So I got teachers to teach them. Yuval Sherlo taught them for me. He, these are all guys in Yeshiva with them. You've a Sherlo, David Nativ, you know, all these guys who later become Rosh Yeshiva's other places. But when they were kids in Yeshiva, young. So they taught the Americans for me. And then I did this, for, I was Madrid for two years. I had a computer job on the side. And then, um, and then one year there was no one, Yuval became left and David Nativ left, all these people left, there was no one to teach them. So I started, you know, I'll teach them a little bit until I find somebody. So just to fill in, because no one was teaching them the Zionism, I wanted them to learn from these big rabbis. So I started teaching them. And that's how I started teaching. Okay, but you still haven't gotten to your expertise in Tanakh. So I started teaching. I, I, I fell in love with the Yobu Nun's approach to Tanakh, and I started teaching it. So and what I learned from them, I taught to them. 
And so, and then, and, but then you took it to a different level, not only into English, but your own chidushim. I, I translated, what, what they do in, in Israel, I, I translated culturally to American culture. Okay? You, you, take, you take the Israeli shiurim, it's like totally boring to an American. So you can take the same ideas, but culturally translate it to an American audience. That's why I was able to do that, I think. And have you ever calculated on how many people you have taught via either in person or on the internet or both of them over the years? Never calculated. No. I'm not good in math. <laughs> Even though engineering was pretty good. And I, it, and, I could do an integral. And I don't and, and, but in terms of your online, the, the Tanakh Center, uh, there was a period I remember I used to get weekly emails from you yeah. with the with the parashat materials. Yeah. So and a lot I, of people received them. How many people read them? I don't know. Well, I think a, a lot, lot of people, because when I mentioned Rabbi Liebtag, immediately people start talking about that you've been their teacher, whether it's in person or not. Uh, there was a, I, I don't know if in the States yesterday, uh, there was a big piece because the recordings from Nacham Shalom were put up on Spotify. And everybody oh, was wow. very excited. They recorded, there were recordings from when she was on the radio. And not everyone knows that she used to sometimes play those recordings for her students when she was still alive. So it wasn't a big secret that there were, but they just produced them. And everybody is talking about how they learned from the Chamalevuds. Mm -hmm. But people talk about you the same way nowadays, that they've learned from the the, a okay. different style, a different style. Yeah. Did you ever study with Lachama when you were in BMT? Or? When I was in BMT, I went to her class, I didn't understand a word. <laughs> she was awesome. She was fearsome. She was fearsome, yeah. We, 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 we I, I remember, I know, I remember walking into about. the class and praying that she wouldn't call on you. On you yeah. uh, because when she did, if you didn't have the right answer, it was not a pleasant experience. But in I terms better of, trick. I just didn't go to class. Ah, it works out much better. And in terms of when you look at a text of Tanakh, yeah. um, how do you how do you come up with the ideas? Does it just hit you or you read it like a newspaper? What do you mean? Give by it that? the same respect you give a newspaper article. It should make sense. Okay. okay. So my, my rule of thumb is: don't look for questions; look for understanding. And so, don't, it, when 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 the biggest teacher, the biggest mistake teachers make is read these verses and find me five questions. You follow? Right. So you're not looking. You're looking for questions. You're not looking for understanding. You know, stu study something. Try to make it. It should make sense. So outline it. You know, title it, make paragraphs. And then it needs to make sense. In search for understanding, the questions will find you. That's the rule so, of thumb. But then also you have many times where you will compare you will compare stories or compare texts from one place, the other, the way things are styled. If you open up a if a person opens up a humash, this week is is Bamidbar. Um, what would be your advice on how to learn Parashat Bamidbar? Teach it to somebody. To teach it, that that's the best way. And when you teach it, you have to prepare a class. So when you're teaching something, your level when you prepare a class, you understand it much better than when you're listening to a class. So, so whatever, so how do you learn a book? You teach it. So luckily, people like to learn. So I have an advantage. Yeah, no, that's true. But, but most of my learning I've done from teaching. Because when and, you have to explain something, oh, things begin to make sense. But for instance, you open up the text of Bamidbar. And will you tell people look at Rashi, or you just say look first at the text? No, no, no look for no, look for understanding. A question after something bothers you, then see what the parshanim say. If it so, doesn't bother you, you won't appreciate a parshan. If you don't, yeah, no, I, the parshanim all study the text before you. They were bothered by something. They're sharing with you their insights based on their study. If you don't go the process of studying the way they did, you'll never understand them. That's what I try to teach my students to do. You know, so study, st study the text, and when something bothers you, right, then you'll see the same thing bothered the Parshanim. And when you read the Parshanim, they'll come to life. So, for example, I, I remember uh, many years ago, Nechama had published an article about a global approach to text, which sounds very much what you're describing. And the recommendation was that start out with a Tanakh without any of the Mepharshim, because they can get in the way. Yeah, but bro used to say, study Rashi like study Chumash like Rashi did. Rashi without, Rashi. Study without Rashi, <laughs> study without Rashi. And so, your students, who I know some of them are in the room with you, but not visible right now, uh, when you open up, when they open up a Tanakh, they're going to open up just the Tanakh. They're going to read it for understanding. Questions might pop up, and then you'll tell them to start looking at Mefarshim, the, the commentators, if we get that far. 
And now, now, th 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 there's a major assumption mm -hmm. that Chumash is a book to study and not read. You understand the difference? Yeah. The, our assumption is God gave us a book. Mm -hmm. God gave us a book to study. Now, he gave us a book to study. You know, it's God gave us this book. And through study of the book, we build our relationship with God. Now, God didn't write a Shulchan Aruch. It's not, do, wait, do, do, wait. it's not a law book of here's what you do when you get up in the morning. It's not written like Shulchan Aruch. It's a book full of stories. And the stories have to be studied. I'll give you a quick example. When, when I'm studying uh, the story of creation, let's say. Okay? So um, in creation, I'm sure you know, there's a pattern where day one is parallel to day four, day two to five, and three to six. Um, assuming you remember Or and Ma'orot, and, you know, and, and the Rakia, and then birds and, and, and then land and land animals. It, it's a perfect match. Now, Chumash says in telling you in the beginning, before you read this, make sure to, to, to uh, match up day one with day four. Got it? It's only when you study the text and look for a pattern, it, you'll, you'll discover it. But, but once you see it, Chumash wanted you to find it. Got my point? And I get the Chumash point. Chumash is written in a way that requires discovery. But it's a little bit different than reading it like a newspaper, which you had started with. When yeah. I, like a newspaper, I'm reading it for understanding. I want to see what, but, but I'm not going to start saying, hey, the opening paragraph of what he talked about is similar. No, I, I didn't say read it like a newspaper. Give it the same respect you give a newspaper. So explain I mean, that. You know, you're assuming the article makes sense. And if something's missing, oh, I must have meant newspaper, continue on page three. And then you get into it and it doesn't match. So you, so you start finding what column did it mean? Or maybe it meant page four. In other words, if something doesn't make sense, pay attention to it. Don't just read it like Sukhita Zimra. You understand? Okay. So I'm not saying read it like a newspaper. Give it the same respect you give a newspaper. That expect it to make sense. And when it doesn't make sense, it's on purpose. And would you recommend? In other words, Chumash is giving you a text to study, and as you study it, things won't make sense, and God wants you to realize what doesn't make sense, and then you start trying to put things together. And there's pattern. I'll give you an example. So you have those patterns in in Breshit, right? So what's the meaning? That's not that's not in a in a podcast, but you have to pay attention to that and ask, based on that objective analysis, what message is Chumash giving? So I'll just give a quick example. On the first three days, God gives out names, doesn't he? He names the sun, the moon. The, I mean, he, gives, he names the day and the night and the sky and the, and the land, right? Then, and he stops naming things. The last thing he makes is man. And in, in the next chapter, what does man do? God gives man the job to give names to the animals he made. He names a different species, right? And then man gives a name to who? Man gives a name to, to his wife. First the species, Isha, and then and then Chaba, her name. And then who names man? Who names man man? Remember? Remember that's in Parakeh. God gives man a name. And then, but man's giving names to all the things that God created. Now, the question is ultimately what's going to happen? And little by little, how does man give names to animals? He's not, name, he's not giving pr proper names, he's naming species, right? That's based on knowledge. And then he perceives, oh, there's all these powers. An ancient man perceived not only different species, he perceived many gods. There must be a rain god. There must be a fertility god. There's all these different gods. And he started believing them. Now, you keep that process going. Ultimately, he'll make a name for God. It's through the process of perception. You don't see God. You perceive God. So ultimately, there's the whole theme of naming leads up to Avram calling out in God's name, the idea of Kriya B'Shem Hashem. Now, when I study Chumash, I'm not sure if that's right, but you can't miss there's a pattern going on where shame is a big deal to the point that Noah calls his first son shame, which makes no sense unless shame is a big thing. And he blesses, Baruch Hashem Elokei Shame. There's, I'm, what I'm getting at is there's a theme developing in Chumash, and you have to be sensitive that that's what Chumash is up to. Chumash wants you to find the theme. And there's all these stories in Breshit that are setting the stage for, for when we're chosen as a nation. Now, when you study that, when you're reading Breshit, I'm reading a book that's written to understand why we're chosen. So it's, it's a different form of study, but the whole point is you're studying a book that's written to be studied, not read. And the message is through its study. That's, that's the key thing. Now, how to interpret it, you can argue. That's, that's our tradition. But if you don't study it, you can't, begin to, you can't appreciate the interpretation of it. That's the main thing I try and teach. 
and, but to develop those that appreciation of the of analysis of trying to find these patterns, is that something that you people can figure out on their own, or is it the kind of thing where it takes some training and sensitivity, or is it no different than you'll excuse me, Lahavdil? You're, you're, you're a sports fan, right, Rabbi? Language. What? Yeah. Aren't you're a sports fan? Uh, sometimes just, you're, you're into sports, aren't you? It's a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. My, kid, my kids more. Judo for sure. Yeah, okay. But but they, you have all the Chicago teams and stuff. Now, yes. Get, how do you learn how to play baseball? Yeah. Do you just play ball or do you have to have, or you need a trainer? It depends. For some on people, you... it's just, so you, you got to play ball. Got it? You, know, you can teach this, that, but if you don't play ball, you're not going to learn. You can give some pointers here and there, but if you don't, if you don't do it yourself, you'll never understand it. That's why what bothers me all the time is people read all these articles online and never study the text anymore. It's people don't study text. They just listen to articles and read articles. That's why they don't really understand them that well. If you didn't study the text and, and delve into the text, you'll never appreciate all these articles, all these articles, all these people are writing. The people writing the articles understand them because they studied the text and they reached their conclusions. But if you don't play that game, if you don't take a text and study it carefully and, and try to understand it, You'll, you'll never appreciate all the different articles that you're going to read. And in you'll appreciate of, a little bit. Yeah. No, in, in terms of the study. So when you're finding these patterns and then you're able to appreciate that text, how do, how do you develop? No, no, you, don't, you, you don't look for them. They find you. You don't look for a Kiddush. The Kiddush has to find you. What, 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 what happens in university? What's the big mistake? Why they come up with such stuff? I call it Narshkai sometimes. To, to write a paper, like to get an MA, or to the page, you have to write something that no one ever wrote before, right? That's the rule of thumb. You can't write something. You can't write a summary. You have to come up with something new. So you're searching for something new, and therefore you're looking for a chiddush. Got it? When you're searching for a chiddush, you're, you're not going to find anything. A chiddush has to find you. When you search for understanding, you study something deeply, all of a sudden something will dawn on you. Oh, something will begin to make sense. If you're searching for a chiddush, you'll, you'll, you're going to you're going to mislead yourself. You know, don't look for something new. Just look for understanding. And let the Kiddush find you. Do you remember? Same, same thing with the brisker approach sometimes. Do you remember what the first Kiddush was? That again? Do you remember what the first Kiddush was that you found in Chumash? Um, way back in Chumash. And Navi, about, the stories about, about David being out of order when David found, when, you know, how come David, how come Shov doesn't know Goliath? Okay. You know, how come he doesn't know who Goliath, I mean, how come Shaul doesn't know who David is after he's been his arms bare? So then I realized the story must be out of order and then explained why. That was one. What other ones? Um, I, I, I lose track of what I learned from Rayo Benun and what I, usually, if, if it's something good, it's something I learned from Rabio, and something bad is something I, I thought of. That's usually the rule of thumb. Or but, you, but, but every once in a while you find things and, and uh, they, they I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of something more recent about a Garen Chumash. Like a gear comes up a lot. Right. So it's hard to find out is he Jewish or not Jewish? Is he a convert or not? Okay. So, so you're studying this like 70 times in Chumash the word gear. So, how do you know if he's Jewish or not? So then I thought for a minute, oh, let's differentiate between our obligation to a gear and the obligation of a gear. You understand my example? In other words, okay. sometimes, most of the time, we're obligated to be nice to the stranger, be kind, be thoughtful. It's, you can't miss that theme in Chumash, especially on Yom Tovim. You know, now, 90% of the time in Chumash, it's our obligation of the Jewish people to a stranger. Right? Every once in a while, there's obligation of the stranger, like keeping Yom Kippur, like Chumash on Pesach, um, you know, Pura Duma. There's, there's like 10 times that he's hiving something. And the question is, if he's Jewish, then why mention him? If he's not Jewish, then why is he chayev? You follow? It's a famous problem. But when you study it, just thinking that I have to differentiate between our obligation to a stranger and his own obligation, that, that's something you realize once you study a lot. That's all. You know, you have to, but it's something that in search of what each care was, some, something this dawned on you in the middle. It, it, I, didn't, I didn't have a methodology of how to find that. You follow? It just comes with practice. Now, I'm not sure what the conclusion is, but that approach, let's differentiate between when it's like it's like sort of a brisker derech in uh, in Chumash. 
And in, in terms of the breadth of Tanakh, because often you'll compare places from one place to the next, is that just from practice or is there a technique behind that as well? No, it's, it's assuming that Chumash is doing it on purpose. When, when I make an assumption that God gave me this book and purposely contradicts himself to teach you something. So I'm reading it to find the meaning of the contradiction. So I have to compare the sources. Sometimes there's when, when I have the same story in the Barim and Bamidbar, I have to realize why is the story being repeated and what's the purpose of it? And, and, and if, if, there, if I find the Chagim in Shmot and in Vayikra and Bamidbar and in Dvarim, I have to compare them, but I have to ask myself, why are these elements in this book and why are these in those books? And then I have to learn something from that. Now, I'm not sure what the answer is, but the most important part I call objective analysis, simply studying it. And you don't, you don't, don't know, I'll, I'll give you one last point, which I think is important when it comes to Brashit. Um, when you study Sefer Brashit, almost every single story, it's not clear whether, whether the Avot did the right thing or wrong thing. Agreed? Correct. Right. So yeah. My Avram goes down to Egypt. Right thing or wrong thing? As Zionists will say for sure wrong, and normal people say, of course, you have to, you have to stay alive. Um, sending away Ishmael, no, big argument. By the Akeda, right thing or wrong thing? Making a treaty with Abimelech. Um, Yaakov selling, buying the birthright for a bowl of soup. Um, you know, Yitzchak with the, you know, with Abimelech, the whole thing. Yosef and his brothers. There's tons of things. In almost every single story, it's not clear who's right and who's wrong. What's the right thing to do? Agreed? Agreed. So how are you supposed to look at the message if you don't know what happened? My, my understanding is Chumash purposely wants us to, to ar not argue, to think about what was the right thing to do. And I can't read Chumash and determine what's right and what's wrong. The story in Chumash is a catalyst that takes us to our discussion of what's right and what's wrong. So everyone has to make an ukimta, has to say, you know, oh, if this happened, if it was a really, really bad famine, then it was okay to go. If it was not such a good famine, then it wasn't good to go. But I, I don't learn Chumash and decide whether our ancestors were good or bad. The stories about our ancestors become the catalyst through it that we study in the Beit Midrash and we study forever. And that study is how we build Torah Shabbat Peh. And the, our Torah, that's how we build our values. But arguing about what's the right thing and wrong thing to do. The, there's no way to know what Abram should have done by the Akedah. Whatever he did would have been bad. But the Akeda story is a catalyst that sparks a question, what do I do when my moral conscience goes against a divine command? So we hope they don't contradict and they shouldn't contradict. But that's life, isn't it? It happens all the time. But, but, but having, that, having that discussion, the stories are a catalyst that, that makes us Jewish. And that's the Beit Midrash. And that's, that's the road of Parashan. That's why I, it doesn't bother me who's right and who's wrong. I yeah. want to appreciate... A machloket Rashi Ramban in Ebenezer because it's that machloket that's how I grow from learning the machloket not by finding who's right. And how do you how do you approach? I understand the, my point. Please. Yeah, no, I understand. How do you approach people who look at the avot as almost like malachim, and you don't question? Or as you're saying, the challenge, the the, the beauty is that yeah. we can question. But there are, there's an old school of thought that says, no, whatever they did is 100% right, and they never made a mistake. And yes, That's how I always say, our, our ancestors would never make it to the New Testament. <laughs> because they, they weren't saints. Now, I'm not judging him. It's not our job to judge them. That's God's problem. God gave me a book to understand why we're chosen. So it's not, it's not the, if, if it's, it's legitimate. I understand when you're teaching young children, they need role models. So the Medrash turns them into role models, and it's wonderful as role models, they become role models. Not because they were that way, but because we need a role model. So to build a role model, the Medrash makes them a role model. That's fine. Because I, I learned from the Midrashic interpretation how I should behave. Now, but, but I can also learn how not to behave when I study the story of Yosef and his brothers. So the, the, when, when you study Chumash to understand what God wants from us, right? I'm not studying so much to find out how great we were. It's how great we need to be. So educationally, I don't see any, for a young child, educationally, there's a value in making them saints and making them perfect. That's fine. But for adults, that's a disaster because I don't grow. You know, you know, if I learn, people have dilemmas all the time, what's right and wrong. And, and learn, learning from your mistake is one of the biggest themes of Hamish. All, all the POT of, of Truva are about it. Was man grows by learning from, from his mistakes. 
and 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 expecting to be perfect, you're gonna destroy yourself. You, you can try to perfect, but you have to learn. You have, you have to recognize you make mistakes and try to learn from your mistakes. Or you blame on not like Adam Rishon. He blamed on the first story. You make a mistake, you blame it on your wife. Right. <laughs> well, Mother's Day has passed, so we can yeah. talk about the possibility. But in, when you're learning with your students, whether it's there in Lindenbaum tonight or uh, or anywhere else, will you where, where does medrash come into your conversation? That's what the word means. In other words, there's pshat. Okay? Midrash is, is, there's no Mr. Midrash who wrote everything. Midrash means that in Judaism, especially in ancient times, no one wrote op-eds, no one wrote articles, no one wrote, if you had something to say about life, the, the format you used, I start with a pasuk or a story in Chumash, and I build from that. All the midrashim, patach, with this pasuk. So any, if it's a halachic idea, if it's a machshav idea, an educational idea, the way the rabbis gave over their thoughts is through psukim. You follow? Sometimes yeah. it's shot in the pasuk. Sometimes it's the springboard to give over ideas. But like, doesn't mean that's shot in Chumash, but that's shot in, Ju- in education. So Chumash, the, the Midrash is using something in Chumash about there's four times a parent answers the child to give you a lesson in, in education, which is true, whether that's shot in Chumash or not. And the Rambais a lot to have opinions and thoughts. And the psukim and the midrash, the, the medrash uses psukim as a springboard to develop their thoughts. They're not saying that's what Chumash is coming to teach you. Right? They're using Chumash and their study of Chumash to, to, to give over their ideas and thoughts. No, I understand that. But when, you're, yeah. when you have students studying, will you keep the midrash for later on in the conversation and, and focus first on shat when you're in your teaching style? Yeah, for sure. You always learn pshat first because you can't appreciate drash if you know what pshat is. If, if I read, if I read the pshat, so I take if I take the drash to understand pshat, then I don't appreciate the drash and I don't understand the pshat. You, you go, you come bald from both sides. And what are today? Who are the the key voices in the study of Tanakh? In addition to yourself and your all being known, who are the people we should be looking to learn from? Rashi is pretty good. Ramban. <laughs> I mean, I mean, of, the, of the modern day scholarship. That's, it depends on what, what, what hashkafa you have. Listen, I totally understand hashkafa. I've called keep it simple. Right? Don't let this only, you know, it's very dangerous. If, if, if a text has been studied for a thousand, two, three thousand years and, someone never, and something was never noticed before and someone comes up with something new, 99% chance it's wrong. You follow? And, and therefore, it's a a very logical approach is you can't come up, you can't say anything new. You follow? Because it must be wrong. Because how come Rash, how come Ramban didn't see it, etc.? But Baruch Hashem Ramban didn't think that way. Because if Ramban thought there's nothing new to say because it's been a thousand years of study before him, we wouldn't have Ramban and we wouldn't have a Barbana and we wouldn't have the Mabim. You follow? Okay. The beauty of Torah is every generation, remember, we're like um, um, Gamadim, we're like midgets on top of giants. So our Jewish tradition is always finding new things. But you find them through, through in search, the, the strength of Chumash and its beauty is that every generation finds something new in it. So in our generation, you have, you have, you have, you have Rabbi Mordechai Breuer, you had uh, Rabbi Meidan, you have Rabbi Yol you have Yon, I'm just talking about the Rabbis I have in Yeshiva, but you have Rabbi Sabato and you have, um, you know, Malay Dumim. You have, um, look, look, look at the uh, Yimei Yun and Tanakh and all the people giving classes there. Rabbi Zak is just tremendous. You know, Yoni Grossman. He's a star. Like these, they, they, those are the big leagues. Those guys are. You know, I just take it and uh, use it, give it translation. I just translate it culturally into English. But those guys, those, they're the uh, they're the experts. Believe it or not, uh, Rabbi Liebtag, our time is basically up. I want to thank okay. you, but uh, I do want to make two corrections. One is you are in the big leagues as well. Okay. Uh, and it's not just a simple translation because without your ability to communicate the style that you learned from your teachers, uh, we would not be where we're at today in the study of Tanakh. And I know your students who are there in the room with you know it as well. The, uh, the, the love you have for Tanakh and the love you have for teaching is so obvious to everyone who's had the opportunity to interact with you. I thank you so very much for your time. And I wish all of your Talmudim, both in person and virtual Talmudim, should continue to learn from you for many, many years to come. Thank you so very much. I have to add one thing, okay? Just one last thing about Rabbi Metenki. I always bring you this example. Rabbi Metenki is the best example of how 
a modern Orthodox rabbi can get along with Haredi Rabbanim. In Chicago, you do something that's unheard of. You're on all the boards with all the most, you know, with all the Haredi Rabbanim, the same kashras, the same thing. You know how to get along. Your ability to, to have the idea of your bet right? to, to have your hashkafa, but to be able to, to, not to, to work together with every different hand or cover, not every different type of Judaism is something that other many rabbis have to learn from. So no, with I, that, keep up the good work. I thank you very much. And thank you so much for your time. Have a okay. wonderful evening. And uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. Okay, Bye -bye. thanks. Bye-bye.